This week's episode is brought to you by the Communicore Weekly Goat Line. Give us a call at 424-785-4628 and leave us a voicemail telling us how awesome we really are. But mostly me. Welcome to Season 3! Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical twins. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And I'm recording for my swank office at work this evening. So, I may sound a little different. Probably 10% more handsome, if anything. (laughs) But <laughs> well, just be careful. Don't like use the stapler because then you'll get caught using office supplies for your personal stuff. And what you do you mean? Trouble. You mean like this? Here I am taping things. <laughs> I'm taping things for Communicore Weekly. Do you hear that? No, we don't call it taping. We're recording. Oh, no, we're oh, not, I we're meant, not using tape. I meant literal tape. Like I have ma- like scotch tape. I look like oh, Pee Wee Herman say, right now. With And you can't say scotch tape. It's like saying Xerox or Kleenex. Well, if I can't say scotch sp- tape, you can't say those two things either. I'm trying to put them in as official sponsors of the show. Oh, are they going to give us money? Well, I figure people listen to us cry all the time, so they got to use Kleenex. Wait, so why are they next? crying? Because they're listening to us? Because <laughs> their ears are... Bl- no, because we're the greatest online show. I am so confused as to place. why you would say people are crying when they're listening to us. What else do people use Kleenex for? Uh, not crying when listening to us. <laughs> Gosh, I hope so. I never thought about that. Uh, okay, that's... before this gets worse, let's just yeah. move on to the history segment. It's time for Disney History! Imagine it's 1955 and you're checking out Disneyland. Lucky you and your TARDIS and slash or DeLorean, either one. (laughs) So I'm sure you're having a great time visiting the park in its opening year and we all hate you for it, but you may notice something strange. Not just the cell phone and the selfies and the Instagram pictures (laughs) you're taking, but In Fantasyland, you'll notice a sign that would never fly today. Not only a sign, but a handwritten sign. And it says, this ride is not yet complete. And then with those lowered expectations that you now have, you think, what the heck is this? Well, back then, it was known as the Canal Boats of the World. But today, we know it as the Storybook Land Canal Boats. Okay, in 1952, Walt was one of the first visitors to Madura Dam in Holland. The park was made up of miniature architectural landmarks and and landscapes. Walt loved it and got the idea for his Disneylandia project from there. Disneylandia was going to be uh, 24 Norman Rockwell type miniature stage sets that would travel from city to city by train. Though Disneylandia never got off the ground, Walt loved the idea so much that when it came time to develop his Mickey Mouse Park across from the Burbank studio, he wanted to include a canal boat ride and combine it with miniatures. Now, one of the earliest ideas for the attraction was Gulliver's Travels Through Lilliputin Land, uh, which unfortunately was a little bit unpractical. Um, And another idea was to integrate the new Chicken of the Sea pirate ship lagoon and have the canal boats circling the pirate ship and then returning back to the canals. And in the area where there's a quilt made of plants, the original proposal also included a giant's head and shoulders, kind of like he was resting underneath a gigantic blanket of plants. Um, And the giant would have limited animation, including moving eyes, and his head would gently rock back to side, and, you know, like he was sleeping and snoring. But Walt killed the idea because he thought it would kind of spoil the, uh, the tranquil feeling of the ride. The Canal Boats of the World was billed as Boats of Holland, France, England, and America travel through canals which pass the fabulous sights of Fantasyland. The reality, though, was boats with unreliable outborne engines moving slowly and loudly along the bare banks filled with weeds labeled with scientific names. Kind of like the Jungle Cruise, but a lot less fun. Uh, But people would still ride it, and cast members would basically tell them, this ride is going to be so much better, we promise. Here's what's coming. And less than a year later, in June 1956, the canal boats were replaced with another temporary attraction, 
the Storybook Land Canal Boats. Now, the remodel of the canal boats was part of a $2 million expansion of Disneyland that included the Skyway, the Astro Jets, the Rainbow Mine Train, and Times Sawyer Island. Now, the models were scaled one inch to one foot and were made primarily out of uh, plywood covered in fiberglass. And Walt wanted the sets to be designed as if the characters were just out of sight, so they were pretty realistic. Yeah, the, the level of detail was beyond anything that anybody really could expect. Harriet Burns recalled a time when she was working on a very elaborate stained glass window for the church. Uh, the window itself was designed by Frank Armitage, but Burns went to the metal shop and cut all the lead pieces in colored glass herself. She didn't need to do that, but Walt loved attention to detail, as we all know, and he, she wanted to do it just right. Now, Walt was obsessed with these kind of little details, and Burns said she hand hammered all the locks and poles and the mailboxes for Molly's house, and she made them out of copper and soldered them all, and all the, the gutters themselves on the house were soldered copper. And these are details that nobody else would ever really see, but Walt knew it was there, and that was all that mattered. Yeah, the little structures uh, are supported by an amazing feat of landscape architectural magic. Artists use stunted trees, bushes, and fine grasses to create the miniature flora. In an article about the attraction in E-Ticket magazine, they discovered that Disney's landscape designer, Bill Evans, was able to hunt down a type of evergreen tree found in Van Dam Beach State Park in Northern California for the black forest behind the Seven Dwarfs house. They are more than 100 years old and are naturally dwarfed. Since they were protected, Disney had to buy some from an adjacent landowner who was happy to sell the trees. Now, along with the model buildings in the richly detailed landscape were new Dutch canal boats built by Robert Doors Boat Works. Uh, the e-ticket magazine noted that they were converted from gas outboard motors to electric and are individually powered by direct chain drive from the propeller shaft to a GE motor. Now, there were five different styles of boats, uh, some with teapots on the roof, another with two tillers, and others had miniature stairs. Uh, but they were all 16 feet long and were guided on a rail kind of like the Jungle Cruise. And the initial fleet of boats was uh, only 12, but that grew to 14 later on. The current loading dock is located where the Midget Autopia used to be. And before that, the queue was in front of Monstro the Whale. Guests would be startled when he would occasionally blink his eye and blow his whistle. The little lighthouse was the ticket booth. You leave Fantasyland by entering through the whale's mouth, which is not consistent with the film. But that's okay though, because you know, Walt decided that he was spending a lot of money to build the whale, and he wanted to make sure the guests got a really good look at it, and I guess he got a good look at them. Exactly. Yeah. Now, one of the, the standout uh, landscapes during the ride is Geppetto's Village, and Geppetto's shop actually has tiny toys hanging from the windows, and Pinocchio even has his own mailbox. And the backdrop of that whole setting is the Swiss Alps, which helps to hide the, uh, the Casey Jr. train as it goes by. And in later years, the mountain backdrop would, would actually blend seamlessly with the Matterhorn when it went up, so it worked out pretty well in their favor. Now, from Geppetto's village is a bridge that leads to Pig Island with miniature oak trees and the Big Bad Wolf nearby. And dividing the canal is Peter Pan's London Park. Uh, and the park also has fully mature miniature trees and a gold statue of Peter Pan himself in the middle. Along one bank is a collection of structures from Alice in Wonderland, including Alice's cottage, the old mill, the church with a stained glass window, and of course, the rabbit hole. Along another bank is Toad Hall, home of Mr. Toad. The model was so inspirational that the facade was copied and applied in full scale in front of the revamped version of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride in the remodeled, remodeled Fantasyland of 1983. And further along the canal is the home to the Seven Dwarfs with their diamond mine nearby and 150 year old plus dwarf trees. Now, the highest visual element within the attraction itself is Cinderella Castle, and the castle is a staggering over 15 feet tall. I know, <laughs> it's crazy. But they use forced perspective to make it appear even taller. Now, the obsession with detail was so extreme that the roof of the castle is actually covered in gold leaf. And just beyond the giant's quilt are three old mills. Now, once again, the attention to detail here was very important to Walt. So, Walt actually suggested that tulips be planted in front of the windmills. So, the Imagineers hired a, a horticulturist from San Francisco to locate miniature tulip plants that would fit with the scale of the windmills and they found what they were looking for in New Zealand. The only problem was that the plants, even though they were small on the surface, they had 18 inch stems. So this meant they had to be buried and hidden. 
So in the end, they just couldn't keep the plants alive, so they were removed altogether. Okay, so the final scene leads to the boat storage area and has been dubbed Never Never Land because we never get to go there. In 1994, additional scenes were added from The Little Mermaid and Aladdin. We mentioned earlier that Walt originally envisioned the storybook land canal boats as a temporary attraction, a placeholder for something grander. In early 1957, a replacement was already in the works. The attraction would be called Rock Candy Mountain and it would incorporate the Casey Jr. train. But of course, it never came to pass. But that's okay, because I enjoy taking a leisurely little ride on the Storybook Land canal boats. Because sometimes when you get a good boat captain, they go a little off script and it becomes more jungle cruise, less peaceful, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> did we go on that when you were here? I don't remember. No, we uh, did the uh, the Casey Jr. train, though. We did Casey Jr. Remember, it was all three of us uncomfortably in one seat. It was. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. My phone was is ringing. I don't know if you can hear that. So I'm going to go answer it while we end this segment. So while Jeff is taking his call, feel free to give us a call on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628 and tell us what you think about the stero- <laughs> about, about me not saying that right. <laughs> He's a nerd, he's a geek, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his beat. Ha! It's George's Book of the Week. Okay, this week's book is The Art of the Disney Princess. And this book's been on my radar for quite a while, but it's it didn't really make a lot of headlines when it was released, so it, it sort of just sat there. But we both got review copies recently, and, you know, we both decided to take a longer look at the book. And... You know, it's it's really more of an art book that's a tribute book. And the fact that it doesn't really cover a lot of history really narrows down the audience for this title. But, you know, that being said, it still could be a worthwhile addition to your collection. And we'll get to a little bit of that in a little bit later, I guess. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like you were saying, I mean, it's not, you know, we are very big on reading very research-heavy books and, you know, not so heavy research books. But this one is a lot of... Not a lot of text that we're used to. It was more mm -hmm. art. Um, the, most of the text uh, was short little blurbs from the artist, and there was a short uh, but great introduction from Glenn Keane. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, it's just art and interpretive art at that. Yeah, it, it's sort of like The Art of Mickey Mouse, which is a book I reviewed a while ago. And that's a book that really shows its age because a lot of uh, pop artists from the 80s and 90s worked on it, and it really shows. But this is a little bit different. Um, this has a lot of newer, more modern interpretations of the Disney princess. And, and, and Glenn Keane states in the introduction, this book is a celebration of the heroic young ladies known as Disney princesses. It is a delight to see them portrayed in such varied artistic styles and interpretations by such a gathering of talented artists. Yeah, it was cool because for me, I was really interested in seeing how each of the artists uh, they chose to portray the different Disney princesses. Um, and, you know, some of them went in the more traditional approach, you know, uh, kind of just slightly reimagining them as the as we know them. Mm -hmm. And then others just went totally out of left field and reinvented their style altogether. Um, and they looked great. Um, mm -hmm. There was one with, like, a mechanical hero, Belle, and, and the Beast was kind of like a Transformer. Um, there was, like, uh, some Art Nouveau prints mm -hmm. of some of the princesses. I was just overall really impressed by some of the different stylistic choices that were in the book. Yeah, it was nice to see him take the Disney princesses in directions I never would have thought of outside of the Disney style. Um, I know there were more than 150, you know, they had paintings, there were drawings, there were actual photographs of um, uh, women made up like the Disney princesses in a little bit different style. And and one guy actually took, or I'm uh, sorry, not a guy, I think it was a woman, took uh, Barbie dolls dressed up and actually took them to different places and took the photographs. Some of them um, were actually in Disneyland, I think. Yeah, some of them were in Disneyland, yeah, as well. And, you know, it, it, it takes it out of the using the different poses or anything like that. It takes you out of the, the feeling of the iconic figure that we're so used to. And uh, some of my favorites, uh, I did like the Beauty and the Beast one, but when they showed the princesses in like a movie poster format, because it almost looked like the attraction posters. Um, the Sleeping it, Beauty one, I thought, uh, was yeah. A+. Plus. 
And it really was hard to pick it because I liked almost each one of them for a different reason. There were some that really stand up, especially some of the ones that were sometimes not more than a, a line or two or a brush stroke or two that just conveyed the whole essence of the princess. Yeah. You knew uh, who it was. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I we really can't say enough at how gorgeous the artwork is. Uh, every artist did a wonderful job at interpreting whatever princesses they chose. Um, that said, to me, I felt like, granted it was an art book, but scattered throughout the book, there were um, little blurbs from some of the artists explaining why they chose the, do it, the way they did it and, you know, just a little bit about their process, no more than a paragraph. To me, that was fascinating to go along with mm -hmm. um, their artwork, and I felt like they could have used a bit more of that. Um, you know, I think overall there was you know, one every 20 pages or so, which, yeah. again, it's an art book. I get you want to showcase the art, but I, I would have <laughs> liked to have seen more um, from the artists explaining the choices that they made, why they, you know, especially the Bell and the Transformer Beast one. Where did that guy get, or the girl, I forget who did that, how, where did they get that idea? I want to know yeah. more about that. Yeah, and that's... It didn't need a lot of history of the characters because everybody's familiar with them. We know who they are, what they represent in the films. But it would be nice to hear almost from every artist why they chose something, or, or I mean, maybe they chose to let the image speak for themselves. Um, that's that's a fair point. That's you know, a fair which point. could be part of it. Uh, you know, I really was surprised at how many Ariels, Bells, Snow Whites, and Cinderellas that we saw. But you know, you kind of have to remember. I guess a lot of the people who are artists today would have probably seen a lot of these in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And it would, those films, the direct-to-video, I mean, the, the video VHS releases would have been top of mind for them as well. Um, yeah, I would love more substance as well. But the art was great. I love the different styles. It sort of challenged what I thought of traditional beauty, so to speak, in you know, yeah. a, a Disney princess, because there were a lot of really fun ideas. That they I, used. I kind of also have to mention that there was one print of uh, Kidda from Atlantis, the Lost yes, Empire. Yes, there was I one. I was so happy that <laughs> somebody included her in the book because that's not, you know, when somebody says Disney princess, nobody really thinks of her. But there were a handful that are not on the typical roster of princesses mm -hmm. that were included, and I thought it was great. Yeah, we had a few Mulans, you know, and some other uh, princesses that you don't always see. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think this is. If you're if you're a Disney princess fan, this is something you're gonna like, definitely. I agree. You're gonna enjoy it. And if you if you're a fan of modern or contemporary art, I think you're gonna like it as well. Not for the theme park fans, you know, unless they're theme park fans that like princesses, too, which is okay. As well as as well. Theme, as, so. I'm confused about where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I always try to let people figure out if this is a book they want to try to get you know, based on our review, because we know people purchase stuff based on what we say. So, you know, it, it, it's kind of expensive. So it's not just a book I would buy for a young uh, girl who's just, you know, getting into dressing up as princesses going to the parks, because it's a pretty expensive book just for that. But it's something that, you know, an, an older girl might, uh, boy, that sounded terrible, an older young lady who is enthralled with the princesses might like, or anybody who really does like the princesses. I mean, I admit, I thought the art was fantastic. And totally frameable yeah i wanted to tear really some great. of them out and frame them but uh i won't do that for an expensive book <laughs> no no not unless they send us another copy exactly so. exactly but yeah i think uh this one was the art of the disney princess and we both really liked it and if you have an interest in it you should check it out if it's a legend that you seek come on and take a peek at the window of the week texas glenn's honeybee farm our bees are real hummers. Glenn Hicks, proprietor. Glenn Slippery Hicks, he was actually the director of New Orleans Square, Bear Country, Adventureland, and Frontierland. He also coached the, uh, the company's baseball team for years and led them to many, many victories. And he was also a member of the Order of the Red Handkerchief, a club for cast members who worked on the mine train through Nature's Wonderland at Disneyland. Now, his window, which can be found uh, at the, uh, the Bonanza Outfitters in Frontierland, actually alludes to his hobby and later his full-time job as a beekeeper. He actually sold honey under the name of Texas Glen's Honey, and uh, when he retired from Disney, that's what he did for the rest of his life. So, if you want some Disney honey, get some from Texas Glen. Don't call me honey. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. 
Now, at Big Thunder Mountain Railroad at Disneyland, you'll find a familiar face hidden in one of the buildings toward the in the in the town toward the end of the ride. Now, we all know that the one on the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World is ruled over by Barnabas T. Bullion. Now, who controls the Big Thunder at Disneyland? I'll tell you who. Well. It looks like Barnabas, his iron fist, reaches way out west also, because if you look inside the very first building as you pass it at the end of the ride, you'll see his portrait hanging up on the wall. And of course, Barnabas' likeness is modeled after Tony Baxter, but you guys already knew that because you guys are smart, right? Right. No, they're cadets. They have to be. Of course. There's it's a test. part of what it is. It is. So I remember, you know, we were out there for the commuter tour, and we, I think we rode it at night, and we drove by it, and I was like, wait a minute. Was that Tony Baxter was staring also at us late. the window? I was it like, was that's late. not Tony Baxter. You're like, no, no. I was like, well, let's ride it again. I think we ended up riding it like six times before we got a good view of it. I got to be honest with you. The first time you said, is that Tony Baxter? I thought you meant, is that Tony Baxter <laughs> sitting there waving at us as we go by? And then I realized how ridiculous that sounds. He's like, hey guys, I love Communicore Weekly. <laughs> yes, we, as we, we drive Thank you for screen. doing the Doppler effect on well, his, I figured his I had voice. To. I figured I had to. I said, you know. Um, but yeah, it was it was exciting to see that. I think we had to ride it again, like one of the last days during the daylight. Yeah, we, we did and ride we it, saw it during the day. And we both saw it. We were both like, ah, oh, it's Tony Baxter. <laughs> as we were screaming, wind whipping through our hair. Just generally having a, a madcap time. An awesome time. And of course, was. people that were with us were fans of the show, so it was okay that we were screaming like lunatics about it when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> Other people would have thought we were crazy. No, no, not us. Eh, that could go with Rob. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Well, guys, thank you so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Yes, please be sure to leave us a comment and give us a rating on the good old iTunes. Yep, and email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com if you have any comments about the shows or you want to talk about one of the segments or you just want to talk to us i mean oh that's true yeah we'll do that too yeah that's true very friendly of course like us on facebook at facebook.com slash communicore weekly we're always posting pictures and fun stuff and flying saucer fridays i mean all sorts of fun stuff happens on the facebook page so maybe we should do tony baxter tuesdays tony baxter tuesdays i like your alliteration sir all right we're gonna have to do tony baxter tuesdays yeah we'll do that mustache mondays Ooh, we can include good. all sorts of people for that one. That's true. John Hanch on a couple of them. Walt Disney himself. Mostly Tony Baxter, but but mostly Tony Baxter. Yes. Okay. Mustache Mondays, Tony Baxter Tuesdays, <laughs> Flying Social Fridays. Guys, we have a schedule. We're sticking to it. <laughs> okay, and you can always follow both of us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imaginerding, and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, call us on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at four two four seven eight five four six two eight. Yep, and you can pick up your copy of Communicore Weekly, the musical, the best 45 minutes of your life, we guarantee it. You can get your copy of the musical at Amazon, CD Baby, iTunes, and listen to it for free on Spotify. Hey, yes. Listen, I'm at work. I was listening to it earlier <laughs> at work on Spotify. <laughs> okay, well, for Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck. Thanks so much for listening, guys and gals. We'll see you next time on Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show. Mm-hmm.